Hello, I'm David Winder. I'm from Charles Sturt University, third year studying games technology. And today I will be talking to you about DirectX and porting DirectX applications over onto OpenGL. All right. Now, the steps that we're going to be going through for this is first I'm going to give a basic introduction of DirectX and OpenGL. So we'll talk about uh, the portability of each API and the API um, executions. Um, and then I figure we'll just dive straight into the demos. We'll go through demo one, which will be a basic loading of a texture onto a screen on both DirectX and how that's done in OpenGL. Then demo two, we'll talk about moving that around in the world in DirectX and then to OpenGL. And then thirdly, we'll go into the three-dimensional camera class. And we'll do one for DirectX and one for OpenGL. So as you can tell, I'm a games technology student. This is going to be a bit more directed at games, but I'm sure you probably already have that idea since we're talking about DirectX. So firstly, I'd like to know a bit about yourselves. Um, raise your hands if you have some background in DirectX or, yep, cool. Um, OpenGL, everyone else? <laughs> no. um, and then C++ and Objective-C, yep, okay. The reason why I ask is because when I program in DirectX, I do it on the Windows platform, and I program using C++. And for Objective-C, I program Objective, um, OpenGL via Objective-C. So they're both object-oriented um, installments of the C language, so I'm going to be talking about it at a very kind of high level, so you don't have to panic. We're not getting into the in-depth syntax. Um, so yes. We're going to talk about at an object level, basically the logical idea of how things work. DirectX versus OpenGL. Now the portability issues, you can see that DirectX works primarily on the Windows platform as well as Xbox, which was built by Microsoft, and the Dreamcast as well, where OpenGL works on pretty much everything else. So it works on Mac OS X, Linux, implementations on Windows. It also works on the PS3. Variants on Wii, Nintendo DS, GameCube, PSP, and as you should all know, it is the primary graphics library for the iPhone. It's also used on the Android and Symbian OS. So as you can see, the scale of the platforms that you can develop for with OpenGL, it's um, very handy to learn to use for it. API execution. Now, you might have heard a couple of years back or something like that, um, Microsoft did some in-house testing where it compared its API, DirectX, um, to OpenGL. And its results showed that DirectX performed a lot faster. These tests are actually invalid because they did them using hardware accelerated tests where OpenGL was just run in software mode. So you can actually tell that there would be quite a substantial difference. OK. With DirectX, there is um, a lot more hardware management. So the objects that you use in DirectX, um, you have to set up the original memory allocations and stuff like that. Whereas OpenGL, you don't have to get into that much of a, a depth into the hardware. It makes it a lot more easy to use in that kind of way. However, if you develop DirectX using um, hardware allocations and stuff like that, you get a lot more application-specific code. So there are kind of drawbacks and advantages and disadvantages, but with more application-specific code, generally your code becomes more efficient because you're designing the hardware allocations for that um, application. Okay, mode switches and marshalling. In uh, DirectX 9, the... Oh, sorry, first I'll explain what mode switches and marshalling is. When you use threads, there are two types of threads. There are user-level threads and there are kernel-level threads. Um, when you use a kernel level thread, you have to switch from the user level because that's where you're executing at, and it makes a mode switch to the kernel level. And that um, operation requires some overhead, um, which the, all DirectX threads are kernel level threads, so every time you um, run a thread, it always uses that overhead and always switches to the kernel level to perform its application. OpenGL implements user level and kernel level threads, and because of this, you can actually get data transferred from one user level thread to another user level thread. It's, you don't have to know the detail, but all you have to know is that 
OpenGL can use that to speed up a lot of um, uh, uh, transmissions between threads, copying of data and stuff like that. So it can be faster to process information straight to the GPU without having to go through the kernel. Now, we'll get out of the basic theory. We'll go into a first demonstration so I can talk to you about the logic of behind each one. And let's go into loading a texture. So DirectX was designed as a graphics interface, where OpenGL was designed as a renderer. Basically, the main difference behind that is that DirectX has a lot more convenience classes and convenience methods that makes it a lot less a lot less user code that you actually have to design yourself to perform the same basic applications. You'll see what I mean when I show you the code. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just think of DirectX as it makes it a lot simpler to do generic functions. OK, the DirectX logic. First, the texture is loaded into memory from a file. Um, then a region of that texture is specified. So a section of the texture that's loaded in is specified of what you want to draw. And then that texture and that region are placed into a sprite object. And that sprite is then used to render this texture in this object, uh, this texture with this region allocated. Um, the basics of this is that the sprite object, there only really needs to be one sprite object per project. So there's one sprite object. Multiple textures can keep being pumped into this sprite object. The sprite object is just used to define two triangles in a square formation um, in, on the screen. So the sprite will store the background color that you're going to pump the texture onto. The sprite will store the location on the screen that you want to um, paste the texture. The sprite will store the region of the texture that you want to draw. But the, that's all the sprite's going to be used for. OK, this is the basic texture that I'm going to be loading in. And I will show you a DirectX demo. OK. Now let me just run this to hope that it works. Sure. There we go. Penguin loaded on the screen. Now, I'll just go through the code at a very high level. But first of all, you can see that the, this function is just used to load this texture from file, because it's in the directory. There's some generic parameters that are also passed in, defaults. You want to manage the memory. Um, this is actually used for alpha blending. So you set the color that you want to be alpha blended. Um, and then that's all loaded into this texture file. Uh, okay. Then in the then the region is defined. So because we are loading the very first uh, sprite here, we're just loading this one here. You're going to have to trust me that the width between here to here is 32 pixels, and here to here is 32 pixels. So 0, 0, 31, 31. That's what you specify with the rect object here. So you've defined that rect. Then you just pump that rect into a draw call to the sprite. And that takes the texture, takes the rect, takes the location where you want to draw it, and that kind of information. And that's basically how you draw a sprite onto the screen in DirectX, uh, a texture onto the screen in DirectX. Okay. Now, how do we do that in OpenGL? In OpenGL, it's got the same basic logic. The texture is loaded from file into memory. However, in the way that I've implemented, and there are several ways that you can do this. It's programming. You can do this in many different ways. But um, the region of the texture, I've actually specified. And then that is then stored into an image. So you've just got that um, texture that you want to draw in its own image file. And then that individual image is then loaded onto the screen. It's just a different way of doing it. It doesn't, because OpenGL doesn't have stuff like sprite class. A lot of this code you have to actually design yourself. The differences between this, as I've already specified several times, is that OpenGL requires more user work. If you're performing game implementations, 
OpenGL isn't designed with just the game idea in mind. You have to write a lot of the code yourself. Um, so there's more user code per, pro per project in comparison. However, because OpenGL doesn't support some of those um, convenience classes that are using DirectX, OpenGL is a lot easier to, become, to be backwards compatible. DirectX 9 at the moment, and 11 is coming out, DirectX 9 is a massive uh, beast of information, of redundant code that's used in DirectX 7 that if they flushed it out, the, um, a lot of the past games would actually break and they wouldn't work. So a lot of code that's used has to still be implemented so that they can still, be, still run using DirectX 9. OK, in OpenGL, uh, we, I've got three user-defined classes, Texture2D. I'm going to talk about these at very high level again because the source code is going to be available online later, so you can just play around with these um, classes yourself. But I've got Texture2D, which I use just for loading and rendering an image, an image which encapsulates that class object and is used to hold other information, so scaling, rotation, alpha blending, all that's just stored within the image file. And then a sprite sheet, which is used um, to, once again, it stores an image file, but um, it specifies information about the distances between each sprite and the spacing and stuff like that. So once again, another class that makes it easier to perform these um, extractions. OK, now for OpenGL, uh, using the same texture and everything. Oh, also, um, while this is building, I ran this on the iPhone because I figured if OpenGL will work on the iPhone, then it will work on the Mac. Um, so, yep, let's just get this popping up. Please. Uh, as you can tell, I probably need to upgrade my Mac. Here we go. Got the penguin. There we go. Okay, now same basic set of instructions. First, the um, at the start of the game, the sprite sheet is allocated with the file that we were talking about before. Um, a penguin image is actually created, so that's the individual one sprite, the one penguin image is created just from extracting that information from that sprite at that location, so 0, 0. The spacing's already been defined as 32, 32. That just pulls out that sprite, chucks it into that image. All right. And simply in the render screen, we just have to call um, the penguin image render function. So you render it at that location. Center of image is just if you want to um, render it as the center to be, oh sorry, if the center of image is no, then the point that you locate, the point that you specify in render at point is actually going to be the top left hand corner of the image. If you specify it as yes, it's going to be a center of the image that you're rendering on the screen. So yeah, that's just basically the logic behind how it works in OpenGL. And of course, all these classes are going to be available, the source code, so you can play around with it at your own leisure. This. Uh. Okay. Project two, animating a moving texture. Now, here we go into um, moving a te this texture um, around the world, around the screen, and stuff like that. And we do this by the basic technique called flipbook animation. Now, what that is, is when you get one texture rendered upon another texture, another texture, they're completely swapped out, swapped back in with minute amounts of changes in information. This is done very quickly so that it actually gives the illusion of movement. So you can have a texture with this hand here, then one afterward with this hand here, one afterward with this hand here. Looks like very smooth motion of your hand just moving upwards. I'm sure you do more textures than that, but yeah. It's the basic um, idea behind it. This is nearly used in all two-dimensional games, back into when we were probably all playing Pokemon and Atchikeshin is walking around with his like, little legs and arms moving around. That's 
flipbook animation. Okay. The direct X logic, same process as before as specifying this region that you want to render. However, the arrow keys for saying where you want to move around the screen is actually, actually controls which row of this animation sprite you want to render. So if you're pressing down, you want to render the first animation row. So down, you want to set this row to be animated. If you're going up, you want to set this row, which would be, because it's index based zero, this would be row zero, this would be row one. Row two would be moving left, so forth and so forth. And once you're on that row, a timer loop will continually update um, that column that you want to render. So once you've got the row selected, that column will continually be rendered while you're performing that action. So you'll get that fluid movement that you're wanting. Um, the method of a sprite class to perform this is actually wasteful. Um, I've actually had a look into the coding here and um, you can see when you do a draw call in DirectX with the sprite image, you're pumping in a, the texture location, you're pumping in the region and that's being sent from the memory to the actual GPU because the sprite's stored on the GPU. So that can actually bottleneck the speed and that can actually make that rendering wasteful because all the information is sent, then a region has to be defined, so the image has to be extracted, that has to be loaded onto the screen. So there are other methods that can make that more efficient. If you're having a high performance processing two-dimensional game, this might be an issue to you. Okay. Here we go, DirectX demonstration number two. This is animating on the screen. Okay, now he's moving very fast. <laughs> we can change that speed, but basically just moving up it goes up like that, down, left, right. Moves around the screen based on user input and stuff like that. Just a very kind of fun two-dimensional thing. All right. So basically the texture is loaded in as it is before. Um, no real differences there. The difference is actually on the um, render call. So first the animation state, so the, the row that you're using is set via the the keys, so up the animation state will be one, down, zero, and so forth and so forth. Um, and then there's a timer loop here, which is actually used to pump through those columns. So as you can see, every 30th of a second, the current frame's updated. When it gets to the end of that current frame, we'll just loop back to the start. That's how you define your column. That information is then loaded into the rectangle, which is used to define the region of the texture that you want to load. And then that loading is done into the, there we go, the draw function. Now, this is what I was talking about before. You're, each time you're passing through a location to the texture, you're passing through the rectangle, all that has to be sent from the memory to the GPU. So that's your bottleneck each time. Okay, that's DirectX projects number two. Go into OpenGL. In OpenGL, I've designed it a bit differently to try and optimize the performance of this. So just to show you that um, DirectX does it in a generic approach, because you, can def you have to define a lot of this code yourself, you might as well, there are lots of techniques to making it faster and faster for your individual application. You might as well try and apply these as best possible. Um, the one that I've performed, because I'm run running, going to be running it on the iPhone, is um, initializing all the frames at startup. So I've created four animation objects, which is just an array of four animation objects. Um, each animation object holding the frames for that individual animation. So each object will hold all the frames for moving upwards. The next one will hold all the frames moving downwards. So you can actually select which animation object you want to use based on the key that you press. Um, and then once you've got the animation object selected, you just pass through those frames that have been loaded into that animation object um, by a generic timer loop seen in DirectX. 
Um, okay, the differences. The images are set up on initialization. So because they've all been referenced there, there isn't nearly as much on-the-fly processing. You don't have to do the whole define a region. You just specify which image you want to reference, and that image will then be loaded straight onto the screen. Bam, all in the GPU. Two extra user-defined classes, so just a bit more work here. Um, the first class is a frame, which is just me being really object-oriented. It's an image with a delay timer. So you've got the image file, and it encapsulates that and just adds another um, value that specifies how long you want that image on the screen for. And then the animation object, which is used to store a set of these frames and holds information such as whether you want this set to be continually repeating, whether you want it to go back and forwards, whether you want it to actually run, information like that. OK, let's go to the, direct, uh, the OpenGL demonstration. Don't want to see the DirectX one again. Mm. Okay, now because the iPhone doesn't have arrows, it's easy to use on a keyboard and stuff like that, I've just made it so you can point and click and the uh, the penguin will walk to that location. So let's just click. Yep. Just walks along. There we go. Okay. Now I've changed a bit. So there is the um, initialization. You're still loading that same texture image into a sprite sheet. However, the animation objects are set up, and the you know, memory is allocated for them here. Um, in this little set of nested for loops, the frames for each, um, each animation row is loaded into that individual animation object. The type of animation, so you want it to repeat, you want it to constantly be running, that's all set there. And once you've loaded all that information into your animation objects, First of all, you have to do an update scene. And what this actually does is just passes in that delta value, which is the time since the last, uh, the time since it was, has been run last. Um, and that's just used to update the frames count, just as we, I showed you in um, DirectX. So as you can see, when the frame time is past the certain frame delay and all of that. It just loops through that set of columns. OK. And then render scene, you just call that object, render at the point, and set the current location. Very kind of simple logic behind it. OK. Now, moving in a 3D world, I, I realize that this is quite a bit of a jump from um, two-dimensional playing around and then moving straight into the three-dimensional world. I know it's a large topic, so I thought that we'd just discuss the camera, um, the camera class, which is one of the most fundamental classes in a three-dimensional game. Um, you can't really do much without a camera. OK. Now, as um, the previous OpenGL lecture, I'm not sure if all of you um, were here for it, spoke about vectors and um, such information like that. The camera class holds your initial position, but it will also hold your look up and right vectors. And this is used to define what you will see rendered to your screen. So you have a position, you have your orthonormal axes. Orthonormal means that basically all these vectors have to be right angled to each other. Okay. So when you change direction, you want, these, you want your look vector to also update your up and your right vector. It's basic information like that. So you can see what's rendered to the screen. OK. DirectX holds a lot of vector classes and functions which make the calculations quite simple. Because as we all know, DirectX is designed as a, as primarily as a game in mind. This is a very game-based idea. 
um, you update the movement by just generic um, input calls. So you turn left, you want to update your yaw, so that's your horizontal rotation. You view up, you're updating your pitch, so that's your vertical rotation. And when you update your look direction over here, you also have to update your right um, axis and also, or not really up, you have to update just your right and your first because your up's not going to change when you're just rotating like that. But if you're rotating upwards, you, have, you don't have to rotate your right axis, you just have to rotate your look and your up vector. So that's information you have to calculate. And then when you, yep. Well, you can do it in many different ways. If you're storing the position inside your camera class, you're, doing, you're going to be doing this all in reference to your camera. So um, as I'll talk about in DirectX later, as an, uh, sorry, OpenGL later, um, you actually translate the position of these vectors back into the origin, and you can rotate around the origin all these vector classes rather than having to do it in your own um, over there kind of thing. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, when you're performing a render call, every time the render loops run, the view matrix is calculated based on your look direction, your right direction, your up direction, and that's all sent to the view matrix, which is used to render information to your screen. That's how it's done in DirectX. Um, yeah, so as I said before, DirectX is designed with games in mind. You'll have a look at these functions and say, oh, wow, that fits with that, and that fits with that, and that's it's just one progressive. This is how the camera class is generally created. It's a very generic thing in a lot of these games. OK. Now, uh, when I load this, please excuse the music. Ah, <laughs> oh, can't really hear it. Cool. OK, so yeah, moving backwards, moving forwards, left, right. And of course, there's uh, pitch, yaw. OK. So that's the basic camera class and how it's working in this game. Now we'll just go to the camera, so I'll show you how it's updated. Um, okay. Actually, let's first go to the main value so I can show you how the input's called. There. There we go, input detection. OK, so press W, you walk forwards. The camera's forward movement is actually updated by, so this is just going to be, this information I'm passing in here is basically the amount of time that I've um, performed that action for. So I pass that um, float value in, and if I'm walking forwards, I want to increase my current position by the direction that I'm looking at times the amount of um, units that I'm walking forward for. Um, that's the same with, say, if I'm calling a strafe. So if I'm moving right, I want to increase my movement or decrease from moving left. I want to change that position by my right vector. OK. So the same if I'm flying. But yes. Please tell me you haven't frozen. OK.
you know what, let's get rid of that. You're just probably gonna, I'm, I'll just talk to you about the rest of it. When you turn your, your or when you change your pitch, so just say you're rotating your camera to the right, you pass in an angle that you're going to be rotating your camera by, and then that angle and the axis, so because you're rotating to the right, the axis that you're rotating around will be your up vector. You're rotating to the right, the axis, the up vector, you use that to generate a matrix, and that matrix is applied to rotate your right vector and your look vector. That's, there's just generic functions that are done to make that a lot simpler in DirectX. It gets rid of a lot of the maths. <laughs> um, okay, and that's also the same for controlling your pitch. When you, uh, so hopefully this might be working now. No, all right. When you call your um, update cycle, you just use those axes that you've kept on constantly updating and your position, pump that into a matrix. That matrix is used to set your view position. All this information you'll be able to see because I'll chuck the source code online. Hopefully it won't crash for you. Okay, OpenGL logic. Now, it doesn't have as much of the maths help of a function as, oh, that, that I've found in the um, OpenGL library. However, um, I've changed the camera class using different implementations, as, as I was speaking about before. Um, the three vectors are set up, and by translating these three vectors back to the origin, you're able to then perform rotation and um, functions around the origin. You're not going to have the issues that you would have if you were performing that action away from the origin. So I'll give you an example. If, um, if I'm away from the origin and I'm looking at this direction and I perform a rotation, I'm still rotating around the origin. So not only is my look vector going to be updated, my position vector is also going to be updated. And we don't want that. We just want to update the look direction. So we translate everything back to the origin before we do a rotation. Um, yeah, so rotations are performed um, around the origin. And, okay. Sec. OpenGL doesn't have uh, a view matrix like DirectX does. Um, it has the model view matrix and basically everything. So objects are used to um, change, uh, objects are used to be updated by the, view, um, the model view matrix. Um, the camera's also used. It, it's just a different mode that you use. Just thought that I'd talk about that, yeah. So DirectX has a specific matrix that it uses to render the camera class. OpenGL just has everything in the model view. Okay, OpenGL info. The matrix calculations, once I show you the code, they may appear to be done in the wrong order. So you'll see, first of all, a translation away from the original point then a rotation, then back to the um, position. But it's actually because matrix calculations are done in reverse order. So what looks like I'm translating away first, I'm translating back to the origin, then rotating, then translating back to its original position. So just the, you're going to have to trust me on this one. OK. GL you look at, um, that's a function that OpenGL provides, which is actually quite handy. You just pump in your eye position, your look and your up axis, and it just creates a matrix that you use. That matrix will set the current matrix mode that's being viewed. So if you're setting the current matrix mode, you don't have to perform any other calculations. So that's all you have to do. And you do that every time in the render cycle. OK, let's go to the OpenGL demonstration. Now, I did this just on the Mac because I thought it would be a lot easier to show you camera movement without having to worry about trying to do, get control it on the iPhone. So let's just have a look at this. Yeah, as you can see, I'm a really good graphics artist. Um, but yeah, you just, that's your yaw, that's your pitch. Um, up down, um, you click anywhere, it'll move you towards that location. Yeah, so that's your basic camera class being updated. OK. 
Cat. Now we'll go into the camera class code. This is a very cut down application, so I can just show you the code right here. Um, but yeah, so you've, you control your yaw via your um, translate the vectors back to the origin. Um, so you, which is done reverse order here, so you can see that it's put back to the origin here. And then you perform the rotation around the y-axis, so that's what specifies the y-axis there. And um, then you translate it back to its um, um, original position. So you've got your rotated section locate updated there. And this information, once it's all been processed, changes the model view, and you can use that to update your look at vector. I know that code looks a bit chunky, but yeah, that's, that'll all be available for you guys after to have a look at. So hope that you'll give that a, a look. And it's the same as the way that pitch is updated. So basically, you translate it back to the origin, you control your rotations this time around the x-axis, and then you translate back to its original position. Then you update your look vectors again. Okay, and this is what I was talking about with the update cycle. The time an updates run, you call that GL lookout. You pass in your I position, your Z position, uh, your, sorry, your I position, your lookout vector, and the up vector, which is always going to be remain as um, one because I'm, that's how I'm setting it. But yeah. Okay. So, deep breath. I know we covered a lot of topics um, in that past you know, 45 minutes. Uh, it's probably a lot to get your head around and stuff like that, but um, what have we covered so far? So we've covered loading a texture in DirectX into OpenGL. We've covered the animating of that texture and then just the basics of a three-dimensional um, camera class. So. That's the essence of the DirectX. And I implore you to um, try all this code out once I publish it on um, the I don't know, dev world once where it's going to be put up. But um, to summarize, I just thought that I'd finish with a bit of a joke. There are three people in a car. And this car is driving along, comes to a sharp turn, goes off the cliff. Um, these three people, they jump out. And in this car, there was a business administrator, an engineer, and a programmer. And there's a discussion about between these three people on um, what they want to do like, as a result of this. The business IT person says, um, see, I see the problem was that they couldn't actually judge the turn. So what he wants to do is he wants to organize a series of meetings to make the turn more noticeable, put some arrows up, all that stuff. The engineer says, no, no, you're wrong. Okay? I see the problem is the brakes. They weren't strong enough. I want to take the car back to my lab. I want to." Um, upgrade it, and that should fix the problem. The programmer says, well, you know what? We should take that car, we should take it to the top of the hill again and run it down, see what happens. So what I implore you all to do is dive into the code and try it yourself. Okay, thank you for all your attention.